welcome everyone so today we have with us it's my pleasure to welcome honorable mr justice kurin joseph former judge supreme court of india and honorable mr justice sanjeev sasdeva judge delhi high court to over this forum and board i thank them from the bottom of my heart for having agreed to educate us on this very important and contemporary topic of discussion that is electronic evidence and cyber crimes with me i would also like to introduce mr anant garg and mr angel bharadwaj advocates who are moderating today's webinar along with me and so as to ensure that we are able to kick off the session at the earliest i now request dr amit george to deliver the introductory note and set the stage for today's discussion over to you amit yeah thank you nitesh uh, i am honored to be delivering this introductory note in relation to the topic of discussion by the esteemed panel uh to start off in a slightly cliche direction uh, as we all know covid-19 has proven to be an overwhelmingly disruptive factor in most walks of life uh, the disabling effects of which we are experiencing on a daily basis uh, one limited area however where uh, covid-19 has had a transformative effect can be said to be in the arena of technological adoption wherein we are now witnessing a sudden and accelerated embrace of technologies in certain sectors which were otherwise not so welcoming in the past this move from the relative fringes to being the very engine that drives our social sectoral and economic interactions is actually uh, pregnant with great potential axiomatically this would only mean that a far larger percentage of contemporaneous documents and communications exchanged between parties such as contracts and letters would now be effected through an electronic medium be it computer generated receipts emails videos audio recordings scanned copies etc therefore in the realm of adjudication the post covid world will witness a massive increase in the amount of litigation where e evidence will be front and center of the contestation between the parties in this context however it is relevant to refer to the work of joseph talbi who has identified innovation has historically been driven by and as representing a creative response to four particular events now uh, talbi identifies these as being technological opportunities market opportunities institutional searches for improved performance and finally and most relevant for us what he terms as problems now with the current embrace of technology being driven by the urgent need to overcome this covid-19 problem and with its inherent emergency response model one cannot be unmindful of the fact that users who have now been left with no other option would not really be aware of the possible pitfalls and dangers of this embrace in many contexts this creates a significant problem not only in terms of the knowledge deficit and the inefficiencies that this may engender but also in terms of the susceptibility to a huge increase in the incidence of cyber crime both in terms of overall numbers and potential new types of victims please note that these numbers are not small to begin with a widely cited study finds that in the year 2018 there were more than 27000 cases of cyber crimes which were recorded in india which was apparently more than double the number compared to the cases recorded in the year 2016 the toll of these crimes in financial terms is also mind boggling extending to several billions in us dollar terms it is in this background that we have gathered here today now in this light i would also like to briefly talk about our esteemed speakers who really need no introduction therefore instead of attempting to project a pseudo biography in a few words i would like to very briefly point the focus on aspects which are germane to today's discussion justice kurian joseph as we all know retired as a judge of the supreme court of india after a long and illustrious tenure in this particular context through justice joseph's landmark judgment in pv anwar versus pv bashir in relation to section 65b of the evidence act while speaking for a three judge bench the law in relation to electronic evidence was given a life of its own 
in as much as it was held that the general law on secondary evidence under the evidence act would necessarily have to yield to the specific provision in relation to the electronic record this judgment is still date the definitive pronouncement on the controversy and is widely cited it will be very interesting for us to hear justice joseph's views on a subject that he had the occasion to deal with in its relative infancy and for which he charted the initial path through his seminal judicial pronouncement now justice Saj sanjeev sajdeva as we all know is a judge of the high court of delhi a senior judge coming to justice sajdeva's engagement with the subject this can be seen in various pronouncements across rosters now eschewing reference to various judgments one example which immediately comes to mind is his judgment in national lawyers campaign for judicial transparency and reforms in which he dealt with proof of the ubiquitous and humble whatsapp forward in terms of the provisions of the evidence act further i would be amiss if i do not mention the fact that while hearing a criminal case in the high court in the early days of the year 2019 justice sanjeev sachdeva took suo moto cognizance of the abysmal resource crunch at the forensic sciences laboratory delhi which was severely delaying and compromising investigation into matters of cyber crime and allied prosecutions while the matter was thereafter heard over many dates and various measures were conceptualized and sought to be implemented to improve the efficacy and functioning of the forensic sciences laboratory what is most pertinent for today's talk are the following observations made by justice sachdeva in the matter during a hearing held on 15th january 2020 when covid 19 was an unknown phenomenon in india and most of the world and i quote the concerned officers competent authority has to keep in mind that with passage of each day more and more cases would be reported for examination by the forensic science laboratories and since the manpower with the forensic science laboratories admittedly is far less than what is required to clear the backlog it would further add to the backlog and create a problem in efficient and effective disposal of cases which are referred to the forensic science laboratories now this apprehension of a huge increase in future on a lighter, lighter note if we read this passage while being cognizant of the pre covid 19 context that it was written in might make us believe that justice sajdeva is possibly possessed of a crystal ball through which he is able to peer into the future on a more serious note with reference to the topic of today's webinar this foresight and awareness of our limitations on the infrastructure front as well will definitely stand us in good stead now with that and without further ado i will hand back the mantle and i thank mr nitesh mehra mr angel bharadwaj and mr anand garg for having me over over to you nitesh thank you so much dr amit george that was a wonderful insightful introductory note as well as setting the stage for today's discussion now i request uh, honorable mr justice kurin joseph sir to start with today's session over to you sir and thank you amit uh, for the introduction yeah you will see in my the 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 situation today because of uh, the pandemic all of us are sitting from home and uh, i had the advantage of um, you know simultaneously carrying on two sessions one formally i was attending another session also and in between i came to this session on cyber yeah it's an it's an extremely uh, wonderful session and wonderful occasion for me to be with uh, my beloved brother sanjeev such there good to see in this common platform and be sharing the views uh, on this um, electronic evidence and uh, cyber crimes as amit said we are only yet to see how many cyber crimes are being committed because people are a lot of time <laughs> during this pandemic sitting at home but uh, uh, some records show or some information show that you know there have been a uh, lot of uh, misuse also of this uh, internet uh, during this uh, pandemic period well every every technology has its own advantage and disadvantage and this being a new uh, phase of uh, litigation all to them it's good that you know you have uh, you thought of it as you have thought of uh, organizing a program like this so that you know the the public the litigants 
and the lawyers and uh, people like us also would be benefited out of our uh, mutual exchange uh, of uh, knowledge. On this uh, information technology, maybe there is one of the legislations I've seen which is sufficiently weak. You will see hardly very, very, very few definitions there, you know. Being a, it can take in anything <laughs> and it can restrict anything also. That is a, a, a very peculiar type of legislation. Well, all these had to be introduced in view of the technological advancement. Otherwise, you know, we were all very happy with our old evidence act from 1872. Very crisply worded and, you know, very sharp and very precise. You can't budget this way or that way. It was, uh, it in that context, you know, now a new concept or rather a new type of appreciation of evidence or new evidence or appreciation of evidence. So from the part of the prosecutor, from the part of uh, the, the lawyer and from the angle of the judge also, you know, this is very important. Uh, while I was a judge in Kerala uh, and then out in Himadal also, we used to conduct a lot of seminars uh, for the prosecutor and the trial judges also because uh, it was a new concept altogether. Nobody was aware of uh, how to properly investigate, how to present it, and that the, the, the judges also were not quite comfortable because they belong to the old generation. So they had to be trained also. So, and also all the stakeholders, or rather all the duty holders were brought on the same platform and we have been uh, discussing. Particularly in Himantel, we had a lot of uh, such cases attaching on the NDBS also where you know, this, uh, uh, this has been widely misused to the cyber platform. So thank you once again the organizers uh, for this uh, beautiful platform. So we have a, a very specific topic today, electronic evidence and uh, cyber crimes. So unless we know what is a cyber crime and what is an electronic evidence and rather what is an evidence. Uh, let me take a logic caveat first. I am here only to give an introduction I'm here, uh, as I told my brother Satseva, you know, I want to listen and to be enlightened. Yeah, but uh, we, we will certainly, and that's only my caveat, we'll together be here and we can have an interactive session with our uh, fraternity of uh, lawyers also. So as far as evidence is concerned you know, under section three, it is oral and documentary. After this uh, electronic uh, issue came in, the electronic evidence or electronic uh, record also was uh, deemed as a document. So it, it just come in the documentary evidence now. So that way, if I, if I can give a, a, a crisp definition of electronic evidence, it is data comprising the output of analog devices or data in digital format that is manipulated, stored, communicated by any man-made device, computer or computer system, or transmitted over a communication system that has the potential to make the factual account of either party more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. You know, <laughs> it's very difficult to catch it. But this is actually the, the concept of uh, the electronic evidence. And uh, as Amit mentioned, uh, Yes, we, we, we had to discuss uh, a bit of it uh, in the context under section 65B. It was an election dispute where a speech rendered uh, by a candidate or somebody who canvassed votes for that candidate. How, how does it uh, become admissible as evidence? In that process only we had to. So what was actually presented uh, uh, before the uh, election tribunal was only a tape recorded version. Whether that would be admissible in evidence without uh, the compliance of section 65B. That was the case that was discussed uh, in the factual matrix in which the context we had to go in uh, into the earlier uh, decision on the Navajot Sindhu's case also. And we had to say that it did not, did not carry the, uh, what do you call the true intent of section 65B and we had to overrule it also. If you ask us, ask me, as the author of the judgment, if you write it today, probably it will be seen uh, in a wider angle as well, no doubt about it, because this is, this is now it's, uh, six years now. Over the six years, you know, law has developed, jurisprudence has developed, uh, the, the overall uh, 
concept uh, our overall approach on cyber crimes has also been developed and cyber crimes as you know uh, the moment uh, today we have a particular approach or a particular device or a particular uh, method uh, on which uh, they manipulate and uh, the moment uh, a prosecution comes in then they change the device is like to the pornography sites also we had a case in supreme court lawyers also part of the bench um, for banning the pornography sites we banned 68 sites uh, with the cooperation of the government of india within a week thousand more sites uh, uh, were you know uh, introduced in the platform and i'm told you know the youngsters in all the metropolitan cities at the maximum what you call misuse of this internet for this pornography by sitting this pornography sites that is that is what i just wanted to observe as an obiter yes in the coming uh, to the uh, so we have seen the electronic evidence and what is this uh, cyber crime cyber crime is defined as a crime in which an electronic communication device is the object of the crime or used as a tool or target or used incidental or as a witness to commit an offense and those cyber criminals may use information technology to access personal information business trade secrets or use the internet for exploitative or malicious purposes so this is actually the 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 situation which we have i have just only attempted a bare definition or a bare analysis of what an electronic what evidence is what electronic evidence is and what cyber crimes are now coming to the specifics and to the more details i would love to uh, leave it to my brother sachdeva uh, and uh, probably we can have it you know, for a better discussion because uh, i found that from my experience in the previous a few seminars on the cyber law itself uh, this information is not what is actually uh, required or expected from the speakers they have specific questions as to how to handle specific situations in the cyber crime uh, area uh, so therefore probably i will leave it at this and then um, leave the uh, forum to uh, my brother and then we can have the interaction thank you thanks a lot uh, justice joseph to throw the light on this uh, author of the Un anwar ali sarkar's judgment and the views taken by you now i request his lordship justice sanjeev sadeva sir to take it over from here sir over to you thank you justice joseph and uh, let me tell you the judgment authored by justice joseph in anwar bashir is actually a masterpiece one must read it it's been referred to by several later judgments of the supreme court and it explicitly deals with the provision as to how you will prove electronic evidence now uh, you see the difficulty in to today's scenario is that people when they come up the come across the word electronic evidence they are very overawed we don't know what kind of evidence we are talking of but in today's scenario every piece of evidence has some bit of electronic evidence connected with it you take a photograph you take a video which is uploaded everything today is recorded in a digital form and becomes a piece of evidence now i have a little bit of powerpoint presentation i always love sharing a powerpoint presentation because my view is that a picture is it speaks more than what one uh, is actually worth a th about 3000 words so i'll start with my powerpoint presentation straight off now the question is what is cyber crime now the these were the famous words which were spoken on 20th july 1969 now when someone says eagle has landed i am not talking about the jack higgins novel of 1974 eagle has landed or even the famous world war 2 movie eagle has landed which was made on that book but what i am talking of is the words first spoken by man on moon Neil Armstrong, who was the commander of Apollo 11 on July 20th, 1969. These were the words first spoken by a human on the moon. Eagle has landed on the moon. Now, Apollo 11 was launched on the moon using a computer that has 1,300 times less processing power than iPhone 5s. Now, question is, how is it relevant? Words spoken on the moon, Eagle has landed. 
well how it becomes relevant is the guidance computer of apollo 11 which took apollo 11 to the moon and brought it back had a processing speed of 1.024 megahertz iphone 7 iphone 5 has 1.3 gigahertz and now the new new computers which are coming of new phones which are coming have processing speed of 2.6 2.3 gigahertz the ram the random access memory of that computer of apollo 11 was 4 kilobytes and today we talk of 32 gigabytes phone uh, 32 gb memory and then things like that storage was only 32 kilobytes that was the kind of a computer which took man to the moon and brought him back now imagine the computing power that you have in your hand look at this iphone i think this is 10 has 2 into 2.4 gigahertz samsung 9 had 4 into 2.7 gigahertz processing speed imagine the speed that you hold by a device in your hand that means sitting in your room you can really take 100000 apollo 11s to the moon and bring them back that's the kind of technology we have in our hand from 1969 till date look at the development that has happened now these these are some of the cell phones i don't know some of you might not have even seen the ones which are displayed over here now we are actually used to these swanky devices the initial ones didn't even have a screen it just had a small uh, display where you could only see the number even the messages were not there was no such thing as an sms service which came in with pagers and then subsequently now we have full fledged computers on our phones this is how a 1984 macintosh used to look like and today we talk of 1 terabyte uh, hard disk or uh, we are looking at 5 uh, terabyte hard disks and stuff stuff like that initially when the computers were launched in this country they had no hard disk you had to insert a floppy disk for the program and floppy disk for the software and the floppy disk had a capacity of 1.2 kilobytes and then it became 1.2 mb now that was the processing speed we started with and now look at the processing speed we have but the evidence act now let me take you to a journey into the world of imagination it's a world with no boundaries world with no limits world of limitless potential is the virtual world we today we live in a digital world everything we do is digitized this is a new world it's actually like a discovery of a parallel planet since it's a new world there are no laws no legal order no countries no territories no boundaries no identities no names and no addresses everyone is free to visit this parallel planet just go into your google browser and visit this planet we have found the new parallel world the virtual world people don't have identities they create their own identity you log on to one of these social media sites it asks you for a profile what name do you want to represent yourself you can choose any name you can choose any identity there are no properties space is in abundance you acquire as you desire now if you uh, i don't know how many of you have actually attempted this if you go to gmail go to the very last page of gmail when you open gmail it displays about 50 uh, latest mails go to the very first mail that you ever received from gmail at the bottom it will show you a counter which is actually the gmail space that you have in your gmail account and that counter keeps moving it keeps increasing it keeps in increasing the space that you have in your gmail account with every usage you increase the gmail uh, space and let me tell you there are no governments there are no rules of the game no referee the government never reached there it is the corporate houses and huge corporations that reached there first they developed the space so they control it L let's talk of the india's entry into the virtual world 31st july 1995 west bengal chief minister made india's first cellular phone call inaugurating modi's telstar's mobile net service in calcutta 14th august 1995 videsh sanchar vigan nigam limited launched india's first full internet service and the internet service let me tell you used to be through a telephone line you had to dial up 
connect and it took i think a few minutes to download a photograph and there were these one or two sites where you could log on and download some games or some pictures that was way back in 1995 and uh, the cell phone that we today use the outgoing cost of a cell phone uh, call used to be 36 rupees a minute and used to be in pulses of a minute so the moment you cross 60 second you will be charged another another 36 rupees that's how the cost was and today we are talking of few paise for a call with internet came the social media and we are all familiar with all these logos there are so many social media sites facebook predecessor started facebook as actually a face mash on 28th october 2003 it was started as a site for students to connect with each other in the university february 2004 facebook was launched as the face bank facebook but, uh, it became very popular in harvard university now the facebook popularity has ever been growing there are so many people i think virtually everybody is on facebook whatsapp social media now this is how facebook is going uh, growing day by day billions and billions of people are using facebook twitter then we have twitter the number of tweets that are uh, generated every day facebook google plus twitter these are the top 5 social networking sites most people today use social media in their everyday lives 91% of today's online adult use social media regularly social networking is top online activity today and with covid 19 we are only connected through social media so it's virtually 100% of today's adults and all children each other through social media more than 1 billion people use facebook active, actively every month this used to be prior to the covid 19 lockdown now i think probably the number would have substantially increased every minute social media users create massive amount of data and every day we are bombarded with videos photographs related or unrelated with covid 19 now the content this this actually is uh, old uh, information the content must have increased many fold because of covid now there are several legal issues which arise when we use uh, social media sites identity theft knowingly unknowingly we post huge amount of personal data on social networking sites this vast amount of personal information represents a risk to our safety and privacy this data can be used by unauthorized third parties to misappropriate our identity now on facebook one report said that 5 to 6% of the accounts on facebook are fake identity Identity theft doesn't just happen in the movies. It affects millions of people each year and can just as easily happen to you. In the blink of an eye, your personal information can become, well, not so personal. Identity thieves steal your credit and good name to commit crimes that can ruin the rest of your life. With your identity, they can easily open new bank accounts, obtain credit cards and loans for major purchases or binge shopping. They can even use your identity to get passports and government support. Keep your personal information from falling into the wrong hands. Carry the least possible ID with you and never give out personal information unless you know who you're giving it to and why. Identity theft is on the rise and can easily happen to anyone. So take charge. Don't let it ruin your life. When Dr. George started he mentioned that uh, there were several thousand cyber crimes which had happened in the, reported in this country well let me tell you each one of us nearly each one of us has been a victim of a cyber crime or an attempted cyber crime how many of you have got calls from people asking for your otp number or a pin number saying that so much something has happened now that is an attempt at cyber crime Now, just a third-party material posted to a social media site may infringe copyright or trademark or disclose confidential information. Posting photographs and video without proper permission may violate privacy rights of individuals. And individuals' details like name, address, internet, family interests, family, etc., are often available on various websites. Now, you know, when you sort of Google something, 
you all must have seen that uh, you google something you look for say uh, for example a mobile phone you search for a mobile phone on the internet and then you go on and log on to facebook or uh, whatsapp you'll start getting advertisements related to mobile phones supposing you do a search online for say a, a flight ticket to bhopal you do that on a google search switch off your google search go on to facebook and suddenly you'll start getting advertisements for hotels in bhopal restaurant in bhopal or even cab services in bhopal now how does this happen these social media sites share information with each other the moment you do something on the net that is copied and it's actually artificial intelligence there's nobody actually sitting on a computer looking at what you are doing is the computers who are doing the job for them they sit they scan your uh, search profile and then give you results now a simple example is if two individuals were to sit side by side on their own private machines and search for say a cell phone completely different results will be displayed now these results will be dependent on their search history so all these information is actually collected by these corporate houses and shared with each other is it not infringement of your privacy rights now in one of the seminars one of i i was put actually a question by one individual he said look if that's the position then i ordered something online about 10 years ago when i was a student will that information still be available well of course yes that information will be available to individuals and it can be used now passing on such information as to what your interests are what kind of searches you've done on various websites can also lead to invasion of privacy data breach and hacking we we hear of hacking now there is a rumor that so and so companies in entering into countries going into hacking and uh, breaching several sites hacking is a feature which is happening daily there are attempts being made to hack one site or the other there are something called a spy file what happens is sometimes you get innocuous messages innocuous files which contain spy files which then get lodged into your phone into your computer and then uh, lead to certain uh, breaches of data innocuous looking email sometimes you get an email your online services has been suspended due to a mismatch of access code to enable us enable you to continue please log on to so and so and when you log on you will be required to enter your user id and password now that will be immediately copied and uh, used by someone else and in fact these kind of messages are all bogus messages paypal your account has been limited until we hear from you update now similarly apple your apple id has been disabled supposing for an apple user if suddenly he gets a message that your apple id has been hacked and it's uh, we are we are closing it you'll panic because today we can't live without our phones so if your apple id is hacked or apple id is closed you will immediately try and log in with your username and id and that actually if it comes from a spoof site it will be taken away by someone else and tomorrow you might uh, end up losing substantial amount now look at these these kind of messages what they do is they send you these messages which are very innocent looking but are actually fake messages and what they do is by simple change of a alphabet instead of an l it will be an i which will look like the same or maybe have a double alphabet like in this amazon.com there is a double n it looks exactly like the amazon site but there is a double n and you will not notice it you will enter your email id your password and it gets compromised now similarly to information from a bank again it's a phishing link so you must always check up from the url whether it's from a correct site from a url whether it's actually going to icici bank and never click on a link which is which you receive go back to the main browser enter the bank's name and then enter do not click on a link because that could be from a spoof site and you could end up compromising and your entire amount could be lost 
again something like amazon there's no a instead of an a there's an if you see there's a at the rate sign there's a missing a now that's how these people create these sites and uh, commit cyber crimes how likely are you to experience a cyber attack against your personal data Now, more than ever, people are vulnerable to cyber threats like phishing scams, password hacking, and different types of computer malware that can place your sacred information at stake. One of the newest culprits of this online assault is called ransomware. Once installed on a person's computer or smartphone device, ransomware launches an all-out extortion attack against the individual or companies being hacked preventing you from gaining access to your PC or files, literally holding your device hostage until you pay up. In February 2016, hackers targeted Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center by using ransomware to encrypt their computer files, including many patient records. The attack brought all the hospital functions to a complete halt. In the end, the hospital was forced to pay more than $17,000 worth of Bitcoin to regain control of their systems. More recently, criminal hackers successfully released a new strain of ransomware known as WannaCry. In May 2017, hackers used the malware to launch a worldwide cyber attack against municipalities in more than 150 countries, impacting hospitals, universities, manufacturers, and government agencies, freezing hundreds of thousands of computers, demanding that users pay up to regain control of their systems. Still, despite these most recent attacks, many people fail to safeguard their online information and protect their devices from hackers. Because of this, the threat level that everyday Americans face is very high. But there are ways you can protect yourself. Update your computer systems frequently. Safeguard your passwords by keeping them confidential and unique. Don't visit suspicious websites, open email attachments from people you don't know, or click on potentially malicious links. Uh, uh, while just coming for this presentation, I just saw a latest Google uh, uh, news that the latest ransomware now is called Tycoon Ransomware. And this has been discovered in November of 2019 and is targeting all IT sites. Again, if IT's guy target IT guys, who's going to protect you? Criminal activities relating to social networking, evidence of criminal activity, social networks are increasingly becoming a source for discovery and investigation of criminal activity by members. Profiles can be useful in determining the identity of or locating the perpetrator of a crime. Now, this was the case where a murder had happened and the intelligence agencies went into the face social media account of the deceased found out who he had befriended recently and from his chat, they could then nab the suspect. Posting of texts and photos on social media networking working sites have been the source of discovery of criminal activity and ultimately evidence of crimes. Social networking activities have also served as a catalyst for offline criminal activities and charges. For example, the Mumbai ATS attack, Mumbai ATS reported that some persons behind the 2611 attacks were in touch throughout over Facebook. There is huge amount of data available on social media sites and this actually becomes evidence. Government agencies mine social networking website for evidence. In case of a blind murder case, first thing they will do is go to the social media site of the deceased and try and find out if they can find a lead. Given the amount of information publicly available and avenues that government has to seek out such information, government often does not need a search warrant, subpoena or court order to obtain social media evidence. To bypass the need for a search warrant, government agents may pierce the security setting of a person's social media account by creating a fake online identity or by securing cooperating witness to grant them access to information. For example, if you have somebody in your friend list, that friend can share your posts with the government agencies. And even for that matter, you can get a, the accused can get sort of a link or a, uh, invite from some friend, a friend uh, uh, wish. You click on it and then you connect it. And then that person can look at all your uh, profiles and identity. Now question is, e admissibility of electronic evidence. 
Are e-commerce sites subject to the same rules of evidence as paper documents or other electronically stored information? Day in, day out, especially in the, in the present pandemic, we are all using e-commerce sites for buying stuff. Are they subject to the same rules of evidence? With the unique nature of electronic media as well as ease with which it can be manipulated or falsified, would such evidence be admissible or reliable? How do you collect and produce this piece of evidence? How do you source such evidence? How will you authenticate this evidence? Now, these are several questions which arise when we deal with electronic evidence. Electronic evidence can be found in digital files, emails, digital photographs, word processing documents, message history, backup file, saved by various programs. In every electronic device, you will find some form of electronic evidence or the other. Now, what is the digital footprint? The moment somebody accesses the internet, he leaves a footprint. It's present all over the internet. You just need the technology and the know-how to recover it. Now, people chat over WhatsApp, people chat over Facebook, they chat over phones. All that leaves a digital footprint. to be very careful in what you access and how you access it because it is permanent and always remain there. One major issue these days is corporate espionage. Like I said in the beginning that it's not the cyberspace is not controlled by any government. It's controlled by corporate houses. So knowingly, unknowingly, are you disclosing sensitive or proprietary information? Social media tools provide an instantaneous means of communicating with your entire online community. Using these tools in haste can lead to unintended and perhaps even disastrous results. It is possible to scan all emails for confidential secret data and hack confidential data. I'd like to share some slight uh, things on the lighter mode. This is what we always do. Check in. I go to a place and I check in. The entire family checks in, in a hotel in Switzerland, and they've just flown from Delhi. So their social media friends know, yes, nobody's home. This is an innocuous post that she posted.
एक फ्रेंड जरूरी नहीं होता है सावधानी से अपनी जानकारी सोशल मीडिया पर अपलोड कीजिए साइबर क्राइम को रोकिए and the watchman the guard the liftman neighbors everybody who was on a friend list got to know she is home alone so be very careful in what you post online and how you post do you know who's watching you we see everything everything that you do on the internet is watched google always tracks you Now, I recently came across a flight uh, radar twenty four dot com website. It actually tracks every aircraft in the sky. It gives you the look, the origin, destination, where it is flying from, and the real time tracking of where that aircraft is. And if you subscribe to this site, you get further information. so anything that you do is done through the internet and nothing let me tell you nothing is secret they know everything recently there was this uh, social media which was uh, something which was uh, circulated somebody wanted to order a pizza so the person on the other side said sorry sir this is not good for your health because your medical record says so he said i want to pay by card sorry sir your card has been blocked by the bank so every information is available on the net now uh, we use this google maps very often we use this google maps do you know how google actually tracks or gives you this uh, information of blue yellow and red it tracks every cell phone which is connected to google and incidentally nearly every cell phone is today connected to google and it tracks the movement the speed at which from one point to the other point all cell phones are traveling and then determines whether it should show it as blue it should show it as red now incidentally an artist in france tried to fool google and tried to prove how this was happening so if you have something like 78 cell phone and put them in a basket on an empty street And since he was moving slow, so you can see the green line is turning red slowly because he is moving at a very slow pace. Even though the street is empty, Google Maps got fooled into starting to showing it as red. So that's how he kept walking empty street and the street started turning red. presently at so and so time so and so place it knows you are there where you are so if someone wants to track you it's not very difficult bloomberg last year january came up with this article everyone from amazon to apple this is actually the photograph of a motherboard which is there in every system you will find a motherboard in every computer in every every phone every device uses a motherboard though of a different nature everyone from apple to uh, amazon to apple to us military use this piece of equipment from a company in california this was hacked with a tiny chip the chip was as small as the tip of a sharpened pencil virtually impossible to trace it and this chip permitted the company which had installed it to bypass every security system every virus anti virus and it could hack into that system so that's the kind of technology we have we're talking of corporate espionage who owns and controls your content you take a picture put it on social media share it with your friends on whatsapp who controls the copyright on it well i doubt if any one of you has ever read when you download an application there is the terms and conditions which are projected and you are asked to say i click i agree 
and then move on. Now, either you get it or you don't get it. So because we want that app, we all say, I agree. And one of the conditions that they say is that anything you share on their social media site belongs to them. So if you take an amazing picture, put it on WhatsApp and share it with your friends, the content is assigned by you to the social media site. So they own everything. But it's either you use it or you don't use the app. Now, we always have that feeling that, look, I put something on, I don't like it, I delete it. Now, will it actually get deleted? Anything you put information on the site, will it be deleted? We don't read the terms of policy. Can you actually delete any content? Digital evidence tends to be more voluminous, more difficult to destroy, easily modified, easily duplicated, potentially more expressive and more readily available. So if a cyber crime has happened with a device, even if the person has deleted the data, it can still be recovered. Nothing put on the internet ever gets deleted physically. And it's very difficult to erase a deleted a digital file. In life, you purchase your electronics, your groceries, your clothing, whatever else you need. You take off the packaging, you throw it in the trash can, and once a week, someone comes to take it all away. It's like magic. Once it's gone, you never have to worry about it again. Unfortunately for us, the same cannot be said for deleting files on a computer storage drive. For one thing, usually deleting a file just moves it to the recycle bin, which has no sanitation technician who comes and removes it every week. It's simply a different folder location where files are stored indefinitely. The file is still there and anyone with access to your computer can find them. Silly Linus, once it's in the bin I can just empty the whole thing with one click and my computer tells me, hey, this is a permanent change and that file will no longer be accessible on your computer once you do that. And you would be correct mostly. The file is no longer easily accessible on your computer, but there is a huge difference between whether a file is easily accessible and whether it has actually been removed. On both magnetic and solid state drives, the bits of data that make up your photos, music, tax records, and whatever else are naturally kind of scattered around. And the way your operating system knows where to find all the pieces is, on NTFS formatted drives anyway, through the reference to it in the master file table. So back to deleting stuff. Removing a file from the recycle bin only removes the master file table reference that points to the pieces that make up that file puzzle and registers the space that it used to take up as empty. This gives the operating system permission to go right over it, but that does not mean that right after you clean out your recycle bin, the file is gone, not by a long shot. In fact, there are many programs that are dedicated to reconstructing deleted files, some of which can do so even after a drive has been reformatted. And using those programs right away, like right after an accidental deletion or reformat before lots of the data has been gradually overwritten, has saved many a person's bacon from costly or upsetting loss of data. But sometimes you want to get rid of files permanently from a storage drive. Like if you were going to sell it or donate it. In that case, how do you do it? Well, there are a few tried and true methods that we'll highlight today. The first one is to delete all the data on the drive, then fill it up to capacity with new random data over and over again. This method really wipes your whole drive, so make sure you have any important family pictures transferred to a new drive before you go ahead and do that. The second is physical destruction of the drive. Both fun and effective, but obviously you won't be able to donate that drive. That's more for if there's very sensitive data on it that you just need to get rid of. Speaking of things that are fun. So really speaking, whatever you put does never get deleted. Electronic evidence is any probative information stored or transmitted in digital form that can be used at trial. Digital evidence is information of probative value that is stored or transmitted in binary form. Evidence is not only limited to that found on computers, but may also extend to include evidence on digital devices such as telecommunication or electronic media devices. Before any digital evidence can be accepted, it is of utmost importance to ascertain its relevance, veracity, authenticity, 
and also to establish if it is mere hearsay or if a copy is being produced instead of original that's where the judgment of justice uh, joseph comes in in anwar bashir whether you are producing original or whether you are producing a copy and if you produce a copy then what are the safeguards that have to be put into place where will you find this electronic evidence it can be found on any device computer hardware memory now i'm going into going to give you show you some videos on practically how electronic digital forensics has worked Only on 7 News. For the first time, a news camera allowed inside the Boulder County Forensic Lab for Computers, where we found the cat and mouse game of catching criminals is changing. 7 News reporter Amanda Cost revealing the new technology cracking cases and sealing convictions. So this is off of a phone as it happens. It's a case of he said, she said. At this point, no one knew what was going on. Even the neighbors don't know what's going on. And in fact, when police arrived, they find her with blood on her face, and they thought initially she was the actual victim in this case. Emily Cole was arrested, later convicted, but on trial claimed she was the victim. But this recorded off of the victim's cell phone 45 minutes before the event. Well, I'm going to handle what I'm going to handle. I know where you live. I really know. demonstrates what she had intended to do. It's digital evidence. That's made all the difference in a lot of these cases that we prosecute. Another example. Circling the house. Where GPS coordinates confirmed the stalker's route and pictures of the child victim found on Luis Gutierrez's computer sealed his conviction. All of that w would have gone undetected because no one was there to see it. Mom's ex-boyfriend was stalking the daughter. And a lot of the evidence um, found on his computer really helped in the prosecution of the case. Discovered he... Only on seven... Now, that evidence which they were talking of, which were discovered from a computer, in fact, was a photograph of where a child victim was being abused. But the identity was not available. They could not see the face of the victim, so they didn't know who the victim actually was, and see how digital forensic helped. A girl kneeling on a bathroom counter. To the unassisted eye, there's no way of identifying the person taking this photo, the perpetrator exploiting this young child. We've got the pill bottle here. As I bring it up, you'll notice the more pixelated it gets. Apart from the pharmacy and a first name, Stephen, it's unreadable. It nice this technology can change that. So now we can see what the medication is and the first two characters of the prescription number. That led detectives to this man, Stephen Keating, and they found another clue. We had a close-up image of the suspect's hand. By applying filters, they can bring out the detail. It was actually the very first time that we were able to pull fingerprints from an image. So this is really strong evidence to put this offender behind bars. Absolutely. And he is now serving time. He's now serving a 110-year prison sentence. Now imagine, for the first time, they could actually extract fingerprints from a photograph. Not on a photograph, but from a photograph by applying filters, they could take out the fingerprints. Now sometimes what happens is the report, police report comes that there are no fingerprints available on a bullet shell because it's been wiped clean. Now, a professor in England, by using only equipment worth 500 pounds, developed a system which is now a complete game changer in the world. From an unassuming office in Northampton has come one of the most significant breakthroughs in forensic science for years. Dr. John Bond from Northamptonshire Police has developed a technique to uncover hidden fingerprints from bullets, even if they were wiped clean. It's quintessentially British. This cardboard box contains the prototype developed for just 500 pounds over three years, but it could help resolve thousands of murders around the world. In the US, police forces have told us they have literally thousands of unsolved murders where a firearm's been discharged, shell casings like this one have been found at the crime scene, uh, and conventionally they can't find fingerprints on the shell casing. So could we help? And we're both police try and do so for them. 
Dr. Bond realized that when someone handles a bullet, the sweat on their fingers will slightly corrode the metal. So even if a print is wiped off the casing, the corrosion remains. He's worked out how to recover that lost print. It's been named as one of the top inventions of the year, and even mentioned on the hit show CSI. Now, Detective Tony Roten hopes... See how technology can help. Another issue in digital science is metadata. Now, what is metadata? Metadata is data that gives information about other data. Every digital file would also contain metadata about the file. For example, in a digital photograph, as to which camera was used, what lens was used in a file, as to the author, number of characters, when created, when edited. Now, this was a photograph I took, and day in, day out, Evidence is produced in court where a photograph is produced with a 65B certificate saying this photograph was taken by me. For example, well, this photograph actually is photograph of Shimla. I had taken it from the uh, judge's lounge in the Shimla High Court. Now, what if I were to tell you that I took this photograph in, uh, say, October last year and I give an affidavit? saying this photograph was taken by me from, uh, say, my Samsung phone in, on 1st of October 2019. Now, in what way would you be able to ever cross-examine the witness and say it and establish this is wrong? One example is metadata. Now, there are several ways of extracting metadata. So I extracted metadata of this photograph. And it showed me that this photograph was taken with an iPhone 7 Plus on 22nd July 2017 at 5.13. It also showed that the back camera of Apple iPhone 7 was used. Now, thought came to my mind, what if I were to copy this photograph from one place to the other? Will the metadata change? So I copied that photograph from one computer to the other. and the metadata remained the same. It continued to remain the same. Now, this was a photograph. Well, this is a view that you get just before you are entering lay. And this was taken from a Samsung phone on 16th of June 2016 at 7.02 p.m. Now, again, this was another camera. And this records Canon EOS 600D on 16 June 2016. It gives you the firmware of the camera, even gives you the lens that was fixed on the camera and the serial number of the lens. That kind of information is available in a digital photograph, which is in the form of metadata. Then what I did was I edited that first photograph then let me check if the metadata changes. So it showed it was taken from an Apple iPhone 7, but Windows Photo Editor was used on it to edit it on 30th July 2017 and the time when it was edited. But it incidentally continued to save that original date when the photograph was taken and the camera and the lens which was used. So if a photograph is edited, it will give you that, yes, this is an edited photograph. Now, this photograph incidentally was taken by another camera. And this gives you the date and time that was yesterday at 7.54 by a Sony camera with the lens. Now, this is the metadata of that image. So every file, every electronic file contains a metadata. For example, this is a PowerPoint presentation, metadata of a PowerPoint presentation, which says when was the content created? When was it last saved? How many revisions? How many slides? How many words? Similarly, for a Word document, when was the content created? When was it last saved? When was it even printed? This was another photograph. You, you all must be aware of something called location services. Now, whenever we download an app, it says, should I keep the location services on? Now, if you have location services of your camera on, this was a photograph taken from a camera from a phone, which had location services on. So this showed a Google map 
of where the camera was placed when the photograph was taken so when i blew it up it gave me exactly the location this was in srinagar at the the lalit so this records the metadata of that photograph this available in the digital image i didn't have to do anything i just went into the digital image search the metadata and got it out so that is the kind of information which would be available in every digital file now uh, another issue which arises we with these days especially with electronic is we are talking so much about aadhar the privacy issues with aadhar now see what is happening world over <laughs>技术在一四年，我们突破了人眼的识别准确率。那达到这么一个超过人的一个能力之后，它就有一个非常潜在的一个很大的一个市场可以去做应用。比如说，我们可以让机器去自动的判别。阶段的话，我们会呃通过布在重点呃地方地区的这些摄像头，如果出现我们的公安的重点布控人员有出现，而且它的频率很高。in 7 minutes they could trace out an individual and recently uh, there was also a video on social media as to how they tracked and controlled corona patients they would actually track if someone steps out of the house they would track that individual and also track people he crosses on the way and then uh, spotted them and tracked them further so that kind of technology is available in the world So Steve Jobs once said, "People who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do." Thank you. Now I think uh, I've taken enough time. Back to Nitesh. Nitesh, now, as Justice Joseph said, we'll take some questions, and I'm sure there would be several questions. Sir, there are there are several questions which has been uh, now raised up, you know, by the viewers and participants after seeing your PPT. It was so we much informative. Try and answer as many as we can in the limited time that we sir, have. Sir, uh, so I now request Mr. Angel Bharadwaj to start with the first question. Mr. Angel Bharadwaj. Very good evening, sir. What a wonderful presentation, sir. I have never seen such a kind of presentation. Really taken aback by whatever. Uh, Whatever uh, things you have drafted, there are so many questions. I don't think you you will need some time to you know answer them, sir. So let me now. Before, before Mr. Angel Bhardwaj starts, he is just a uh, web box that he will share his location <laughs> and more, and he will be visiting out of the India. <laughs> It is an eye opener for many, most of us, yes. sir. Seriously, please, please uh, continue with the questions. Sir. Yes, so there is a question from Manjusha Kudre. uh she she asked how could one produce the sms uh, photographs videos stored in your cell phone in front of the honorable courts what is the cell phone gets what if the cell phone gets crashed how to store those evidence as a precautionary measure before the cell phone gets crashed so uh, just a joseph would you like to uh... Uh, brother you, you can continue because uh, they are asking us to what what uh, the do technical, uh, technical i'll deal with on that issue 
uh, you see what happens is so no they say the sms what etc but the phone got crashed or so then what to do probably you, uh, my dear friend you be you would have listened the brother uh, saying uh, my lord saying that you know there's nothing that is not available you may delete it your uh, what do you call the the, the you, your phone may have got crash but it is digitally available it can be and it is it can be permanent also i think the slide shows three possibilities it can be traced it can be shared and it can be permanent also so that that's the clue from which uh, you have to tackle this um, question you see it will be retrievable because the hard disk even if the phone crashes is the software which switches on the phone which gets which gets crashed but the data in the hard disk or the memory chip of the phone would still be accessible mm. forensic experts they actually when they when they seize the phone or seize the device their protocol is that they don't switch it on because what happens is whenever you switch on a device it creates a log mm. that it was last switched on on so and so date for example if a uh, say a computer is used for cyber crime on 31st of december and it is seized on 1st of january now normally what would the io do the first thing he will do is he'll open it try and copy it and try and see what is inside and he does that on the 5th so the log of the computer will say that it was operated last on 5th when the record is it was seized on the 1st so the first thing the accused is going to come forward and say look i was arrested on 31st computer seized or first in the computer seized on the first last operated on 5th so i don't know what you've done so the protocol is and that's what they do with all devices they don't switch them on so even if the system is crashed and doesn't get switched on the cyber experts can recover the entire data on the phone they clone the hard disk and then they use the use the hard disk and extract information so the court can always seize your device send it to the forensic experts and they can create a workable clone of your device and information can be extracted from it thank you very much sir so then there is another question from harish he asks uh, due to pandemic new era has already begun for for e filing virtual court system in india is it possible that uh, there would be increased cyber crime in legal field as well sir uh, whether there is a need of a, uh, any special framework in support of it act or do we need to amend the it act itself you see the it act provisions are already there the evidence act why has it test, uh, stood the test of time over these years is because it's so well thought of and so well drafted and with our supreme court interpreting it justice joseph his own judgment in anwar bashir has again stood the test of time 6 years and it's been reaffirmed by several judgments so there is no legislative amendment which is required the amendment is already in place with the new it act and 2001 amendments that are there the amendments are already there so to, and you see in fact anything related to cyber even court infrastructure is all prone to attacks so that is why it, uh, we have backups we have no in the court system you have no external access it is all routed through nic so nobody can actually access the court and when we we get files we don't access the court computer we get files which are pushed from the computer into our system so there is no inroads into the high, into the court system so firewalls are in place security systems are in place but of course all these are again you can nobody can say that there'll never be an attack on the court system there could be but yeah. we're all trying to prevent it and trying to keep uh, up to it and by keeping still backups and all yeah for your impression there are two backup for an ac no <laughs> two backups so they they are worried by even if one goes you know the other one will be always with that but as i i uh, endorse so i would like to endorse my brother's view that it cannot be ruled out in this uh, in this virtual world nothing can be ruled out you see it uh, adding on to that few years back there was flood in jammu and kashmir in srinagar the high court records part of it got destroyed but in a digital sphere if your entire record is digitized even if one one system crashes completely 
you can be up and about in 15 minutes that is how most of our courts are functioning today we are all are able to hold court from our respective remote locations because of digital data so we don't have to travel we don't have to access physical files we're holding court we're holding data is being pushed to us and we're using it so that's the beauty of this technology thank you sir then there is another question from tanupriya gupta she asked is it possible to prohibit the allocation of look likes and or sound alike popular domains names to other users as this may curb the phishing attacks and spoof domains to a large extent you see justice joseph had uh, mentioned about certain sites which were blocked by the supreme court and within a week thousand more sites came all they did was change the url so if you have .com become .org or become .cn .in and you see problem is like in my presentation i began by saying these sites and these things are not controlled by the government there is no government which controls it's only corporate houses which control it and corporate house the motive behind all corporate houses is only one profit so if it's beneficial for them why will they block it as as a court you will have limited territorial jurisdiction if someone is operating a site from abroad somewhere there really hardly anything that you can do except pass an order brother uh, i just want to ask you but the access to the country can be blocked no i think there was something which we have been discussing while we were hearing that petition that uh, there is one country which said you know uh, th th this will not be accessible from this country is sir, it no so what happens is that you will block a particular url yeah like i said they will change the url no, and change. then and then uh, what happens is every country works with an ip so you have a country ip now there are websites which are available which are in the form of ip hider so you download that uh, that software and that software hides your ip and doesn't disclose that you are from india so it will say as if you are approaching from another country so and that site will be available so there are again uh, even if you block them there are ways and means of getting around vpn <laughs> thank you very much sir uh, then we have another question sir yes anand anand garg i think you are you are muted you are done mute please so sorry sir yeah, so sorry sir i think we have already taken so much of time uh, so much of your time but i only have one question that uh, it is a general understanding that if any party files any document whether uh, documentary or through digital evidence it has to be a genuine document and if it is any forged then a proceedings can be initiated against that party so how does uh, um, that mandatory that 65b provides that you have to file a affidavit under 65b helps the party but like, wh why does it is, is it necessary to file a affidavit if a pa party files uh, any uh, Forge document. He will be liable to be uh, held guilty or to be prosecuted for forgery. So, how does it uh, affidavit helps the party? But uh, that's a requirement under Section sixty-five four, no? Sixty-five B four. Correct, sir. That's a, that, that, but that's what. Uh, why uh, it's a uh, question. So, but why does it? Uh, is it mandatory? I mean, I know it's it's provided under the law. but uh, once uh, if we in any case in a general law it is the problem uh, it, i mean it's it's a uh, it's illegal to file uh, any uh, forged document so whether a filing of affidavit uh, affidavit or non filing of affidavit in 65b helps the party in any manner i know it's a requirement of 65b but if there was no requirement under 65b does it uh, helps the party in any other manner So, if you read that original 65 as to how whether the secondary evidence uh, is uh, admissible, and then you read 65b because we yes, 65 is the secondary evidence by way of a document number, copy, copy not available, copy, etc., etc. All these procedures are laid out. 
Then comes 65B. The whole change to this deemed document process. 65B says a deemed document. When it's a deemed document, to have its authenticity, how do you prove it? No, you can't bring the server all to them. So the. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Gurk, additionally, you see, 65B comes into play when you're producing a copy. Yes, sir. And you're producing secondary evidence. In real world, if the original doesn't come forward, you can see that actually at the face of it, it's a copy. And when the witness steps into the witness box, he has to he has to establish that how he's proving producing secondary evidence because the original is not available, not uh, producible. But in, in, in digital world, supposing you produce a pen drive. Now, one doesn't know whether that pen drive actually contains or the memory card. One doesn't know whether that memory card was actually used in the device or it's a copy of that memory card. If it is extracted from an original device and the data was actually directly stored onto the memory card, then it becomes primary evidence. So for a judge, he would not know whether you're producing an, a primary evidence or secondary evidence till someone points it out. So at the outset, you have to then produce it with a 65B to establish A, that it's secondary evidence you're producing, B, authenticity and veracity, and then you suffer the consequences. So, and it, it, it necessarily not be that it's a uh, incorrect document or a forged document. It may not be tampered, but the fact that it's a copy that you require a 65B, but when you produce the original in court, original device, then, then you don't need a 65B certificate. Uh, sir, uh, should we keep on continuing with the questions? Because they have so many questions, but we have already reached 6. Uh, 6.20. Up to you. If you see, you have some time. We can take a couple of more questions and then... Anand, we can take a couple of more questions and after that... Okay, I... sir. Uh, we are really obliged, sir. Uh, then there is the additional question by one of the uh, viewer that when should a party should take an objection of non-filing of affidavit of 65B? Is it at the stage of uh, evidence? or at the stage of arguments and whether it's a curable defect or not. So Justice Joseph, would you like to... Uh... No, Sanjeev, you can proceed. Yeah. Okay. You see, recently Supreme Court has also opined that the stage at which 65B certificate has to be considered, affidavit has to be considered, is when the document is tendered in evidence. I had the occasion to deal with it at this, uh, in a criminal matter as to whether charges could be framed without a 65B certificate accompanying secondary evidence. And the view that I took was, yes, it could be, because it's only at the stage of evidence that the person would be required to... That, that, that has been uh, appealed by the Supreme Court, because yeah. it's not when the pleadings... At the stage of uh, tendering, evidence only is a requirement. Class. You may rely or you may not rely. So therefore, in case you want to rely, at that time only this requirement. I think Mother's view has been upheld, yes, rightly upheld by the Supreme Court, yes. Point is then, evidence. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Sanjeev, uh, Sanjeev, I just want to have a discussion since between us. Uh, uh, it others also. Suppose in a, in a criminal case, you know, somebody is arrested in a cyber crime, and you know, he is uh, the police in the prosecution in the in the um, during investigation. He is uh, he asks uh, uh, the accused to take out a printout to take a printout from his uh, computer of a particular data. And then, you know, <clears throat> they ask him to give a, an affidavit that it has been taken from his uh, uh, computer. Well, uh, will it amount to, or will it not amount to self-incrimination? It would. So why will he give it? So recently, another uh, case came to light when I was on the criminal roster. Uh, the case was like somebody applied for bail. Now, it seemed to be an open and shut case, but what he produced was a CCTV footage, rather a, a footage from a camera. He said this was shot by somebody else, a stranger on an adjoining building. And that showed the entire incident and showed that uh, he had no role to play. Now, that person was not, the person who actually clicked the photograph was not, uh, clicked the video was not ready to come forward. He said, I'm not ready to come forward. I will not give a 65B certificate. You may take a copy. I will not even give you my phone. But it was a very crucial piece of evidence. 
so in that situation you are then uh, stuck as to how to deal with that uh, kind of a problem hmm. so then probably the io will have to take some steps and procure him as a witness and what if in the meantime he loses his phone and is not uh, doesn't keep a backup so all those issues do arise in electronics uh, evidence but but sanjeev uh, io so you are right uh, he should not and he need not and he cannot also he can he can refuse to give the affidavit but even then the io can retrieve this through other means and come back no no uh, for example if the system is a uh, uh, say it, uh, taken i mean uh, recovered from a uh, accused he will definitely refuse to give a 65b certificate that i have been using it but the cyber experts can then go into the log of that system and find out because every time every time a system crashes it creates a log it and that log is stored in the stored in the data in the uh, system itself that this system had a crash and it gives a full history of what went wrong it's like a airlines black box that the entire sorry and when that comes it becomes a primary evidence it doesn't require it a primary yeah. that's right then it doesn't require a require a 65b uh, sir taking to two small this not audible this you end up Yeah, so one is this that whether section 65b is to be given as a certificate uh, am i audible now yes yes better am i audible sir am i audible yes, sir yeah now it's all right yeah yeah so the sir this is a very small question to justice kurian joseph sir that is the section 65b is to be given as a certificate or an affidavit which sir affidavit no it's an it's an affidavit what's happening uh, one no. both are there no is one is an affidavit now is a certificate the section is very plain okay sir so, and and sir uh, with this i think uh, we shall end the today's webinar it was very informative sir i am just giving a thanking note to honorable justice kurian joseph home judge supreme court of india and honorable justice sanjeev sajeva sir sir while i was listening to justice kurian joseph and honorable sajeev sajeva the first thing which came to my mind was how deep and far reaching this area of law is in course of our normal practice and handling the cases to a large extent our emphasis on the facts of the case means that we usually treat the law surrounding electronic evidence and cyber crimes as more of an ancillary support for establishing our case rarely it ever do we had made into the depths of the subject as we have seen the speakers do so effortlessly in a pointed fashion today it has been truly enlightening and educational experience the ppt presentation by justice sanjeev sanjeeva sir was wonderful experience of learning and informative too the pandemic has truly ensured that electronic evidence will be utilized in a far greater manner in the trials before the courts both civil as well as criminal in the future and we must be aware and scope only as advocates we must also be aware about be prepared to deal with a potentially significant increase in instances of the cyber crimes in future the purpose of today's webinar was precisely this and considering its depth and comprehensiveness we have in the sense of understanding of the law will become future proof Once again, thank Mr. Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph Sir and Honorable Justice Sanjeev Sajeva Sir for this enlightening session and for having spared their precious time to be with us today. We hope that we will be blessed with your future presence on the other webinars with informative subjects, Sir. I thank everyone who has turned out in large numbers to view this webinar today and wish you all the best. Thanks a lot, Sir. Thanks a lot. Good day, Sir. Good day, Sir. I just wanted to share in the when we do, I do, I do my arbitrations now. See, in arbitration, when these documents come, when we ask, you know, if it is not disputed, there is no problem. I mean, this there, you know, is is actually when the dispute comes, the problem comes. So, in this uh, area of arbitration or in mediation, also the parties do not dispute dispute the authenticity or the substance. Then there is no problem. That also is another facet of it. Also, then I will also want to add that you know, I have been really enlightened as I really said, honestly said. by uh, brother sajeeva's uh, presentation but i tell you again it's only tip of the iceberg 
if he wants to present the whole thing you know it will take days and days and we are only see is actually you know the the, more, the law is developing so also the nature of the crimes are also you know is is faster actually is faster than the development of law so be uh, aware and be prepared and be uh, you know be be be, be uh, sharpening yourself any time to deal with all this matters in matter of procurement in the matter of preservation in the matter of presentation in the matter of storing yes that also everything thank you it was really interesting experience thank you lord sir the, sir the seeds you saw in the anwar bashir judgment have now become the plants and justice has they have been taking it over as a tree sir thanks a lot sir the branches are spreading thank you justice sanjeev sir deva sir thank you for your support sir and to my colleagues mr anand garg mr angel bharat and mr dr amit george thanks a lot to all of you thank you thank you sir thank you sir